we've got Charlie the Spaniard Brenneman in the house. And, you know, I've, I've been trying my best to avoid having fighters on. I talked to you about, about that. Just because fighters, I think that when they're in the fight, this is no knock to the fighters I've had on, um, they're in the fight. And that's something, and that's, it's a cool topic, but not everybody that follows this show is into that shit. You know, same. That's why Rogan had to switch his show to make yeah. an MMA show as well as the JRE. Um, but guys who have retired certainly have moved on to some shit. And I want to talk about what's gone on, you know, since retiring. But let's backtrack for a second. I'd like to get a little background on you. Uh, you grew up in PA. I did. And, and you, you were a wrestler, right? Yeah. And actually, Cal, some of this you'll probably learn for the first time. So we'll, you know, talk how we met. But a lot of this, I don't know if you would have known or not. But yeah, I grew up in small town, central PA. Grew up wrestling. Eight years old, first time I saw my dad, he was actually wrestling in an old timers wrestling tournament. So he was probably my age, what I am now, 37. Did he have one of those old school singlets? Yep, the really high and tight the ones. Nuts? Yep. yep, absolutely. I didn't know at the time that <laughs> this is awkward to see my dad like this, hairy chest <laughs> out, hair. up on the high white yep. thighs. Uh, but yeah, and that, that was my intro to the sport. I remember I got pinned in 19 seconds, first match ever. And I just came back in the second year, I did really well, carried it up through high school, had a successful high school PA career, which is good, you know, in the wrestling world, it's like PA, Ohio, California, maybe Illinois, Midwest, but you know, we're certainly one of the, the top states. Wrestled in a uh, small division one state school in PA, Lock Haven University, who actually had several UFC fighters, which is a pretty cool random little fact there. Frankie's from, Frank Yeager wrestled at Clarion, so you know, that's a PA state school as well. And then uh, post that became a Spanish teacher and uh, retired after three years and thought, maybe this isn't for me and yeah. pursued fighting. And so being the Spanish teacher got you the nickname Spaniard. Yeah. So my right? last name is Brenneman and people are like, yeah, it's not Spanish. is it? <laughs> no, it's absolutely not Spanish, but uh, I actually had long curly hair. Is that and Irish? It's like, well, Pennsylvania, Dutch, German. Okay. And then when you get deeper, it gets a little bit fuzzy. Okay. Um, but yeah, any, any heritage that you I know. You have to do of, an ancestry.com to figure that I shit out. I do have to do that, right? Percentages now. Absolutely. That's all we are is percentages. Back back in the day, not ancestry.com, but back in the day, I did one of those tests for my dogs, like the DNA to see what breed she was. We bought her as a, a French bulldog, uh, but she wasn't like AKC, whatever. And we were like, is, is this a French? We paid a lot of money for this dog. Is it a French bulldog? <laughs> Uh, but she came back and she was like part corgi or something like that. Mm. So it was like, shot. That's cool. Corgis are dope. They're super smart. Yeah. <laughs> Son of a gun. But yeah, um, you know, from from wrestling, it was back to school. And then uh, the Spaniard, it was kind of, I, I went in college, I, I have real long bushy hair. And I want to apologize for you that if there's some curly hairs in your shower at your house, it's from the curly hair. It looks hip. like you have a fucking mop on your head, but it's not the same mop <laughs> that when I first met you, but I've never met a white man with that many follicles <laughs> like there's i'm so jealous you know i'm bald now but but uh yeah, yeah there's well, so much fucking hair on your head we're like jack on heights sitting here looking at each other uh -huh. you're, you're, it looks like it looks like when like in one of the old cartoons when they dump like the hair growth thing and then hair just grows all over the guy's <laughs> body everywhere well that, that's, that's so much hair actually there. kind of me right yeah. and and also my son is uh he's one and a half he'll be two and he's blessed with hair like i'm gonna have to it's going to be something in middle school when he's got a hairy chest and hairy arms and a hairy back. <laughs> he was born with a beard. So, That's awesome. Yeah. So you teach Spanish and then you decide, fuck this, I want to get into fighting. Yeah, you know, it was growing up wrestling. It was all I knew. It was just like hardcore training from the time I was eight until I was 23, I graduated. And then after that, anyone who lives a disciplined lifestyle, there's kind of, for me anyway, there's a love-hate relationship. You know, it's like, it's hard, it's tough, it's stressful. Wrestling's so stinking heartbreaking. But then it's like, I love this stuff. I'm addicted to it. So I thought I got to the end of that rope. So I went back home. I, I fat and happy is basically, you know, what, what we would say as wrestlers, like I got fat and happy. And I was teaching and like after a year, that was cool. You know, maybe less than a year. I said, I'd be like, I want to do something. So I ran a marathon and that was like, okay. But I really just loved it. And you can appreciate this, I'm sure. Just grabbing, just, just physically like dominating someone or at least trying to. Mm -hmm. And then I missed that. And I didn't have any other real physical skills other than wrestling and grappling. Frankie, whom I knew from college, had started, uh, he just signed with the UFC, and I was like, boom, maybe that's something I could do. And really, that's what put me in that direction. Oh, yeah. And you fought for how long in the UFC? 
Uh, the UFC, I had two stints. The first one, I think it was like 2010 to probably 2012. And then the next one was, I think, 2013 to 2014. And you retired in 2014? Yeah, well, unofficially. Unofficially. You know, I, we were talking a little bit yesterday. I still get random offers here and there. And if it were for a, a, you know, a shit ton of money, I'd probably take it. But I just really appreciate, honestly, this conversation that we're having right now is as rich and fulfilling to me as probably more so than, than fighting. So I'm, I'm really working on developing this side of this phase of my life. Uh, simply, honestly, I, I just enjoy it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Hell yeah. So post fight career, you started getting into motivational speaking for kids. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I, I lost my last fight in Brazil. I forget which fight night it was or whatever, but I got choked out and you know, that whole year. So I signed on short notice. So it was, uh, I guess going from 13 to 14, New Year's Day of 14. And I got a call from a manager saying, Joseph wants to, you know, they need someone to fight Benil Dariush. And at that time, Dariush was like, a, this was his first fight in the UFC. And looking back, you know, I was fat and happy on New Year's Day. You know, I, I wasn't training. I wasn't intending to fight, but this was my chance to get back. You know, and I thought, this is it. This is the only, only option I have. I took it for less money than I was making the first stint in the UFC. Mm. And I ended up getting choked out knocked out by Castillo in April, choked out by Leandro Silva in, um, I think maybe September. Boom, I was fired. And it was like, what the heck? You know, why did that happen? Why did I even get back here just yeah. to lose three times, embarrassingly, yeah. and then get retired and then get uh, um, fired again? And so then I literally, and I was like depressed. I was, concu- I was just, it was just a terrible time. And uh, I thought, what can I do? You know, what can I do? And I thought, well, a lot of people ask me questions like throughout my career, like anything from, are you batshit crazy to how much money do you make to what's it like, you know, all that stuff. So I wrote a book. I, I just, I never envisioned ever being an author and I just started writing. So many people say, I want to write a book. How do I write a book? Or they sit, they, they pander on that decision over and over and over. And I, I literally, I had nothing else to do. I was sitting at home, nothing to do. Um, you know, I would, my daughter would take naps. She was, she was young at that time. And then I would just start writing. And so I wrote a book and then I learned that Hey, authors are speakers. And I thought, what's a speaker? Hey, what does that even mean? Everyone speaks. We're speaking right now. How do you make a, a living out of speaking? And then I learned a little bit about the speaking industry and, and, and authoring books, being an author, and they kind of go hand in hand. And then it, I learned like what information products were. I never knew what information, like what does that even mean, right? But I realized that people look at UFC fighters as they've, they've, they possess something that the average person doesn't possess, their mind, their body, their, it, they experience something that, only a small fraction of people experience. So I started like figuring out, okay, just like I went from Spanish teaching to fighting, how can I go from fighting to this new world that you're a part of? And, and I'm figuring out, I don't even know what word to call it, um, speaking, influencing, podcasting, whatever it is. But since that time, yeah, and I started in schools because that was where I had my foothold. I knew coaches, I knew administrators. I had a, a good relationships with them and that's where it started. Very cool. What are the what are the things that you talk about when you talk to kids, and what are the age group that you usually talk with? Well, so I first, I started out I started out talking a lot about me, to be honest, you know, and I, I learn I learn the art of speaking on a stage and and relating it to the audience. And I mean, we were talking yesterday about podcasting, making sure you bring something right. And mm-hmm. with fighting, so do you remember fighting? Whenever you would get paid money to go somewhere and wave and shake hands. Yeah, we used to. Do, that's how we met on the tour for the yeah. troops. Yeah. So that's really cool, but that's not real life. And, yeah. and I, I thought, not like in an, uh, an egotistical, arrogant way, but I thought, oh, this is how it is. People just want to pay money to hang out with me. This is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> but then when you're not in the UFC, people don't want to pay money to hang out with you anymore. Yeah. So it's like, oh, all right. So starting a business, my buddies, you know, I have a few buddies who are really into marketing, advertising, digital world, businesses, entrepreneurship. And they'd be like, no, Charlie, stop thinking about you. Stop thinking about you. I heard an acronym one time. I heard a comedian. I wish I knew his name. Uh, but he said, stay, stop thinking about yourself. That, that was like his, his motto. So I really had to like think, what can I offer these kids? So uh, like I said, honestly, it's embarrassing now. It's cringeworthy. But I would just talk about me. I would just tell my stories. Forgetting that, oh, I got to tie in a moral to the story, a lesson, something that they can take, maybe a habit, maybe a, a piece of advice, something. So I, I just, I eventually morphed into learning, you know, talk about my career. What's it like getting knocked out on live TV in front of a million people, being embarrassed, having to get up 
shake hands, look at the camera and then walk backstage when everyone's like, oh, you got your butt kicked. And then have all those people make fun of you on social media. So it's a lot about resilience, a lot yeah. about toughness, a lot about adversity, a lot about habits. You know, I, I read, a, 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 I can say shit ton on here. I normally on my show, I say crap ton. Cause I try, I try. <laughs> You're I clean try. for the kids, Charlie Brenneman, clean for the kids, a true teacher. I'm gonna go out on a whim and say shit ton here. But uh, fuck ton. It, there I go. don't know if I want to oh, go there. I don't, know. I don't, I don't know. cross the line, buddy. Fuck ton. Don't cross oh, the I line. Said it. I said it. Fuck ton. Uh, um, so I read a lot of books, and that what it's evolved into now is I bring my story. But I heard people say this, speakers say this, like in time it just gets boring talking about yourself or using your, you know, your yeah. stuff. So my story, like Spanish t wrestler, Spanish TV, UFC fighter, has become in reality TV. I forgot to mention that I was on it, stood on there. Um, it's become a lot smaller of my talks and what becomes much bigger. And this is why I connect with you so much and why I, I'm either always thinking about you. Yeah, I just told you yesterday, what did I say? Oh no, I told Aubrey, cause his book on the day on your life is one of the books that I read and studied and talked about on my show. And I told him yesterday, I, I think about you every day when I'm in the shower. And I was like, Whoa, wait a minute, let me clarify that. <laughs> so, but the cold water thing, I mean, I did it this morning at your house every, every day. I think, all right, pussy. It's not cold enough though in it's Texas. Not, I was going to tell it's you It's like that. lukewarm. It is it's garbage. And I thought I hit the lottery because you go to hotels, you go to different people's houses. I have my house, you have the standard of cold. And I was like, you never know what you're going to get. It's like just the mental override from the book, you know, boom. And I was like, yes, I won. I did it. It's not cold, but I did it. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> so I read a, a shit ton of books and, and I just bring that knowledge. I, I self-anointed myself. So I was given the nickname Spaniard, but I self-anointed myself, the world's toughest lifelong learner to convey this, this idea of like developing a tough human being who loves to learn and loves to read. And so that message of, of lifelong learning of, hey, like you're at point A, you wanna get to point B. Point B is not for like super human special people, it's for you and me, but you gotta learn how to get there. So this idea that learning will get you what you want, right? Point mm -hmm. A to point B, break it down. I gotta learn, read the books, talk to the people. That's why podcasting is so important. And that's why I love listening to you because you're like, you know, I'm actually, I think I'm sitting across from the world's toughest lifelong learner, but it's like that idea is what I want to infuse, not just to young people, but to old people like. Yeah. I think there's thankfully a bigger shift in consciousness with people that are getting into that, whatever that old category looks like. But for a long time, I remember growing up, like old people had it figured out and he, whether they knew shit or they didn't know a damn thing, they had it figured out and they didn't want to learn more. There's a few people I know that are fucking our age and younger who got it figured out and they don't give a shit about reading or if they do, it's fiction, you know, and they're not trying to gather more information because everything they've read was in college. They got their degree and I don't need to read anymore. I'm done with that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's such a, I don't even want to pass judgment on it. I just want to say like, what a shitty way to live. Like to think like you would go through life without that awe and wonder a child has to gather more information. As as confusing as it is to some people, and it's hard, you know, I just called my mom this morning and and I talked to my aunt and, and they said, you know, what are you down there for? And I said, for work. And it, it's so hard, which it is technically, you know, for work, but it's really hard to explain my fire for what you just said, like, like a child. I, I literally feel like a child. My kids are four and a half and one and a half. And I have the same like gusto for learning that they have for discovery. And as confusing as it is like, what's Charlie doing? What's Charlie doing? Like with my life, you know, what's he doing? I don't get it. You read books and talk about them. You ask questions, you have a show. What's it about? It's about learning. And as confusing as that is to some people, it's also as confusing to me as, wait, you don't? Like you don't read every day or you don't ask questions or you're not like so curious. You know, we're sitting in, in, the, in the office here and on it and I'm, I'm looking at things like, well, oh, I wonder why that's like that. Or I wonder how that got there. Or I'm looking at the art of the book and thinking like, all right, why did they use those letters? How they get that half pick? We're in the gym and I'm looking at all the different equipment. It's like, boom, there are five, you know, synapses firing off in my brain on a, a, a constant basis. And so when people don't live like that, like you said, you know, it, it's, I, I, I'm not going to say I don't pass judgment, but I, I do my best to not pass judgment, but it, it really baffles me. Yeah. The world is so fucking fascinating and there's so much to it and it's cool. Like it doesn't have to be anything. It's just like, it could be, it can be literally anything. Like some people I know are just, they're foodies, right? But they'll read like all these different 
recipe books and they're studying stuff online and then they're just doing like that's the other part piece of that equation we were talking yesterday one of my favorite quotes is it's not enough to know we must do right so you can read everything in the world but if you don't put that into practice and embody it it's it's not worth much yep. right but i know people that and it's like you're obsessed with food but that's that's cool like it's cool that you care about that now let's tweak that yep. so you don't turn into a fat blimp yep. because you're obsessed with mouth pleasure you like you can still it? eat really well yep. and and take care of your body at the same time right but something i mean like even like old timers that are obsessed with cars i think that's a, a generational difference between my dad's era and mine i don't know many guys that are my age if they're not mechanics that are like i'm gonna work on this car i'm making you know this weekend and they've got like a project car and their commuter car and their work mm -hmm. truck i don't know many dudes that are in their you know early 30s mid 30s that are doing that but um it is a cool thing like it's a cool thing to know it's a cool trade to have it's a cool thing to be passionate about because automobiles are fun you know and and branching off that you know this idea of learning so i asked you yesterday about rogan's show you're like what's it about because it's his and i think he's a, a you know a guide for you too in terms of like what he does how he runs a show i i observe things that he does and then morph it into like all right well how can i do that or how can i make that my own and it really is just about learning. And, and no matter what it is, what, what, I don't even care. It, it's not necessarily, I mean, I'm into fighting. I'm into training. I'm into reading books. I'm into like leaders, you know, picking the minds and brains of leaders. So those things fall into my show, but it's about learning in general. When we first started, so my, my partner, his nickname's Dread, and a big, scary dude, not a big, scary dude at all. Just a real, a real bookie type guy who's, who's, uh, you know, nickname is Dread. He works with me. He does so much for me. And at the beginning, he said, uh, he brought up um, Rachel Ray. And he said, what I see us creating is, is a, a thing like Rachel Ray. He said, because I, and this is Dread talking. He said, I watch Rachel Ray all the time. I love that she, he didn't say all the time. <laughs> he said, I've watched Rachel Ray. I know who she is, right? He said, and I have no intention of cooking the meals that she cooks, but I love watching her learn and teach about food just for that, just because I love watching someone who loves to learn and teach about a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't like comic books at all. I was talking to a woman, uh, comic books or cars or whatever it is. I was talking to a woman who was talking about uh, one of the the series, um, I don't know, one of the, the sciency series for kids, the books. I don't know if it was Harry Potter or or whatever one, but I she was talking I, in my head. I was like, I don't give a shit about what you're talking about, but I love listening to you right now because you're so into it. Like you're, so, you've got like a fire for this thing. And I love this exchange of energy or hearing your fire. And then it like tunes me into what she's talking about. But at the end of the day, I, I just want, and I even hesitate to say, I just want, I just want people to want to learn about something. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a key missing ingredient in a lot of schools now. And obviously, you know, you're a dad, uh, kids are around the same age as Bear. And it's, it's um, there's a lack, I mean, so much of this, and this gets, it's brought to the forefront now of our attention more often because we see school systems not giving children what they need. Um, and certainly with the internet, the shit that's failing is figured out at least, hey, this is failing. Mm -hmm. At least that message is told. Maybe it's not solved, but that message is said. Uh, a bit more often and it's heard the fact that kids aren't taught up the passion to learn right like that has to be instilled in them more than the memorization of facts for them to want to learn and to never lose that right so that way when they they have a desire to go to college or go to a trade school or go do whatever the fuck they want to do and then as they're doing that thing they still want to learn right there's continued education one of the things i've talked about here on this show before is that on it pays a grip of money for us to have continued education each year which is incredible in full you know it's phenomenal but they get it aubrey gets it like the the better we are at whatever whatever department we're in or whatever we're doing for this company the more that we enhance that skill set the better we are as employees and the better we are as people working in this system right yeah. it the, just it just makes sense it does and before i, I want to tell a, a story off of that but before I forget, there's a great book that I read called The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. So Josh Waitzkin was a, a chess master and then uh, he went on to become a world champion. I think it was Tai Chi, but he wrote a book called The Art of Learning. How do you become a world champion in Tai Chi? Push hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Push hands, yeah. Push hands? And I even think there's two different types of push hands, like 
it, it's pretty in depth. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll but have it, to pull that up. But it was it was part art of learning, hence the title of the book. But part what I took from it is like, so you know how in fighting or in anything, your mindset and your attitude is like I think the most important. You hear a lot of people yeah. say it's the most important, right? Yeah. Train great, don't believe in yourself, get your ass kicked. Train pretty good, but really have like this overbearing confidence. There's a decent chance you might pull it out, right? Your heart, your will. That's mm -hmm. a, you know your heart, your will. And but what I took from that book is having like um basically like having a mindset or an attitude of learning, and it showed how technically how he learned chess, how he learned tai chi, but then also the overriding like philosophy of just learning. So if he wanted to be a world champ or a high class whatever and podcaster, he could learn it just because he knows how to learn. And it's like, looking back on my life, there was wrestling, there's Spanish, there's fighting, which, you know, I wasn't the best, but I was at a, you know, a high level. And then with speaking, it, it's just a repetition of, of learning really. Yeah. And it, it needs, I really feel like, you know, people, people talk about empowerment all the time. And, you know, I, I just want people to realize you can do it. You just got to learn how to do it. Yeah. Rogan was just talking with uh, Duncan Trussell recently, and they, I think they were talking about the Book of Five Rings. And, uh, you know, the quote is roughly, I'll butcher this somewhat, but to know the way broadly, if you know the way broadly, you will know all things, right? You'll know in everything, mm -hmm. right? So like if you can master one thing, that teaches you how to master everything, yep. right? So like all these things that you've gone through from wrestling to Spanish to fighting, that easily extrapolates out into how you approach what everything. you're doing now, right? Everything. everything in the world. And the, this might be a good segue, which actually I just learned how to spell the word segue in this in this context. It is not segue like the thing you get on and ride, S E G W A Y. It's S E G U E. And I uh, would always I would, seg you. Yeah, exactly. That was the word. <laughs> and Dredd was like, he kept typing it on Facebook Live. And I kept saying like seg or seg you or something and then i like we were texting Ziggy. we were texting back and forth and he like you know phonetically spelled it out so that was a little a little bit there but anyway segue into the next thing <laughs> <laughs> that has uh and i was a teacher by the way so i was a spanish <laughs> teacher for three years i was senor brenneman so i think a, a piece of me is i'm always looking for learning and then to teach it learning teach learning teach so it's a habit of mine and it's annoying to my wife or to my you know like my family it will be annoying to say my it back to me right <laughs> kids no I'm, I'm teaching spanish to my kids and like it's mind you know it's it's like mind blowing mind uh, numbingly strenuous to teach a kid a second language because as i mean we were we were with with barry yesterday and with my two kids i mean they're they're high flying energy all the time so then like to have to add in this idea of like everything I say, essentially saying two times mm -hmm. is like, like incredible. So, uh, you know, Grace, you'll, I'll say something. She's four and a half. I'll say something like, uh, dame, el, dame el agua, give me the water. Or she'll know that one, but I'll say something and I'll repeat it. And she'll be like, okay, dame el agua. And then I'll give her the water. And then she's already thinking about 10 other things. And I'm like, no, 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 please repeat dame el agua. So it's just bringing her right back down. So it's, it's really strenuous so sorry gracie if you listen to this in the future i'm sorry amanda my wife for being so annoying but anyway it, it's part of me but uh the idea of kids you know with bear who's three and a half right mm, he's three yeah three and then my kids gracie and rocky are four and a half and one and a half and they uh i just i'm fascinated like what you alluded to earlier about this idea of kids and learning like it's just like every day i mean literally bear this morning was like running around from corner to corner thing to thing touching, feeling, throwing, jumping, interacting. And to me, that seeing that in my kids is is the most, probably the most magical thing about being a parent. Yeah. It's a damn shame we don't have their energy because it's like whatever, whatever you could do to bottle that. I'm pretty sure they call that methamphetamine, which, which has some side effects, but it's crazy how much energy they have, you know, like it just, it just baffles me. Even when Bear doesn't take a nap, you get ornery and, and a little pissy about things, but it's still balls to the wall until he finally goes to sleep. Crash. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely nuts. And one of the most fulfilling things as a parent, you know, we live lives we have work, we have obligations, responsibilities. But one of the most fulfilling things to me is being in a situation, maybe it's a weekend, maybe it's a day trip, maybe it's family vacation where they can literally be playing in the sand in the ocean for eight hours and then just crash at like 7 p.m. and just be out cold. But it's the most fulfilling thing in the world. 
seeing your kid reach that exhaustion point where they're just like no moss boom and they're out yeah it's just such that's a, that's like all right we finally made it here now mommy and daddy can have a little yeah a little time to read a little time to bone a little time to relax <laughs> like we're, we're all good here we crossed the finish line it's like we did evening. our job you're exhausted yeah. son yeah. daughter and i can't wait i mean i really can't wait and i want to be mindful of what i which sports i put bear in first but i can't wait till there's something i can stick him in for two hours a day that's going to be so taxing but it probably won't be, you know, like he'll probably go to wrestling or jujitsu or whatever the thing is, gymnastics and come out of that, like ready to go do something else. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, when you said that, and then when you opened up that, you know, statement and then followed up with that, I'm thinking the whole time. And I feel like the best way to get them to that point is, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to, sound or or come off as i'm an expert of you know what you're probably an expert in like travel living and social living living out in the wild being free etc but like i think the best way for a kid to reach that point is just by being out and doing like yeah maybe not in that structure right yeah um and like seeing with with you and natasha playing with bear this morning and like literally a man will sit on one couch i'll sit on the other and the kids just run circles and, and jump on each other i feel like because of this, the contextual situation in a class like that, in a wrestling class with a bunch of kids, it's sometimes hard to like really exhaust them because there does have to be order because the scalability of that class. Yeah, they can't just run like a maniac the whole time. <clears throat> or it's a chaos. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's balancing that order and chaos. Damn it. All right. <clears throat> no refuge. But I will tell you that wrestling is, you know, in my opinion, uh, it's unbiased. Even if I, well, if I didn't wrestle, I wouldn't know this, but... I mean, it's incredible. It it creates solid human beings. Yeah. There's no doubt wrestling was, of all the sports that I did, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And wrestling practice, even in MMA, was still the hardest day. Harder than sparring, harder than kickboxing or any type of striking, harder than jujitsu. Um, and I think every in high school, every like head wrestling coach in a high school team was like, we're going to be the most conditioned team yeah. in the state. Nobody's going to outlast us. It's like, all- it's like, fucking, like they could have made a sweater with the same quote on it for every high school team. So, I mean, for sure overtrained, but you know, you're that young testosterone and growth hormone flowing through you. You're eating like a madman just to keep weight on. It's, it's a good time, but ultimately I think that does build character. I wanted to ask you with, and we talked about a little bit about this yesterday with the state of our fucking current school systems. And, you know, you can say it's a political thing and this is, you know, label shit like, well, this is the progressive left and uh, the far left wants everything to be equal and blah, blah, blah. Leave all that aside. We for sure know that kids in school now are everyone gets a fucking participation award. We for sure know that a lot of schools aren't keeping score anymore in games and early on, not in high school, but I mean, early on, they're not keeping track. The kids keep track. Kids give a shit. They want to know who's actually winning the game. They want to know how many points they score. They care. That's why they're playing the game, right? There's some part of us that wants to compete and at the same time cooperate, right? And that's something that Darwin was saying, like the overemphasized, it's overemphasized competition, right? In in uh, in his teachings, cooperation is is written about far more, hundreds of times more often than, than competition. But there's a part of us that wants to compete. And in team sports, we want to cooperate with our team to compete with the other. In single sports, we cooperate with our coaches and our training partners to get us to that point so we can compete on a stage in a single sport. How important is it for kids to know how to win and how to lose? I don't think it could be more important. I mean, it's like primary, numero uno. So my wife teaches in a middle school. And seeing some of the things that goes on in middle schools, it's almost like, so imagine, you know, listener or Kai or whatever, being born without a heart or a lung or an arm or, or something, right? You're just, you're just missing something, right? Kids are missing something. They're, they're missing um, accountability. They're missing long-term, um, long-term versus short-term gratification. Like they're just, they don't know it. You know, like how hard is it for you or me who are really disciplined, live, you know, life as, as best we can and very focused and goal driven and aware and everything. 
Like how hard is it? And I'm not going to speak for you because I don't know. But for me, how hard is it not to just, you know, I go to a doctor's office. They say, okay, 10 minutes, boom, pulling out my phone. Bop, 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 bop. And that's for me who grew up without that. Right. Yeah. And then it came into my life later. And it's hard for me. I have to say, all right, put your phone away, sit and be. Okay. Me, 37. Yeah, that takes some mental override for, to do that. For you and I and yeah. a grown up. So imagine a kid who never had, who always had that, who never had anything other than that. Of course, they don't contain the same things that you and I contain. It's just, they, they never had it. So the kids will say things like, that are just like, like they'll, they'll put on social media, I'll kill you. You can't do it. You just can't, you can't do it. Yeah. But they don't know that you can't do it. Cause they never really learned that you can't do it, you know? So yeah. Well, there's no consequences there because it's not face to face. Yeah. You know, if somebody said, I'll kill you to my face when I was eight years old, I wouldn't actually believe that they're going to kill me. Yeah. That's nonsense, but I might beat that kid's ass. Yeah. Right. Or I might get my ass kicked or I might not, there might be no interaction because a teacher steps in, but either way there, there's some accountability there, right? Yeah. Somebody's getting in trouble from an authority or somebody's getting in trouble because you got to fucking back up what you're, what a, you're saying. And a lesson right? is learned. Yeah. I have chills right now from you saying that. One of my favorite interviews that I did was with a guy named Riley Cote. And he's a, an enforcer in, for, it used to be for the Flyers. And the, the, it, 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 it's like a really, like fighting to me is like really primal. Like I just, I love like getting like pretty much no equipment and just going at it, flat, sweat flying and, and hurting and hurting other people. It's just, it's like invigorating. And he was talking about that in professional hockey and how they're getting away from that and how it, it, he sees it as it's a complex issue. But anyway, he said how it, it, it was it enforced accountability. Like you just, you, you didn't, you didn't attack Gretzky because you knew you were going to get your ass kicked. So you just didn't do it. Yeah. Look at how 1980s basketball was when you had the Pistons yeah. just fucking hard checking dudes down in the paint. You know, like you there, that was pre, it was right as Jordan was coming in, but it was before Jordan was Jordan and they started making it the Jordan, they ushered in the Jordan yeah. era, you know, yeah. like, Hey, he got somebody fucking blew on his ear. So he's going to the free throw line, you know, like back then, like people would get fucked up yep. if you messed up, you know, that was a harder game. And you I'm know, not, there's some accountability there. Yeah. And I'm not saying there should be fighting. I never, I was scared to death of fighting growing up. Absolutely scared to death. And I had some like, you know, the standard knuckleheads in, in middle school who just wanted to tear you down for whatever reason, you know, it was just like just a, a natural part of the process. But there does need to be that source of accountability and that like inner resilience or toughness or whatever. And I honestly look at it, Kyle, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but I look at you know, maybe our parents were saying the same thing about our generation when we were kids. And maybe they were, maybe they weren't, I don't know. But what I think right now is, you know, what we're just talking about. And I honestly look at guys like yourself, guys like Jordan Peterson, you know, a, a lot of the things where you were talking about getting along with other people, you know, listener, if you haven't read 12 Rules for Life, it's a great book. And he talks about that idea of of getting, learning to interact with other people. Yeah, don't let your kids do anything that will that'll yeah. make you want to kill them. Yeah. And it's literally, don't let them do things that would make you want to kill them because that doesn't serve them well in the world, right? And there's a lot of things that didn't vibe with me in that book, but that one totally vibe with me because ultimately how, what you teach your kids, the best tools you can give your kids aside from wanting to learn is how to interact with others, how to play well with others, how to make friends, how to listen, how to interact, how to communicate. And, and in that process, if they're, if they have a habit of being a piece of shit, and just flipping out every time they don't get something they want, they're not going to have many friends and not just peers. They're not going to have teachers that want to teach them. They're going to have people that want to take them under their wing that allow them to grow. And if you don't have that, your kid's fucked. You know, that's how you end up with the kid that, you know, goes to juvie when he's 14 and ends up in the shitty school where all the rest of the <laughs> fuck ups are, yeah. you know, and then, and then try getting into college after that. You know, I went to junior college and walked on an ASU. There's a path for everyone. But my point is it's not an easy path when you, when you're not making friends and you're not playing well with others. And I think that's a critical piece. And I, I think we're in a, uh, you know, like an important, fun, exciting time. Honestly, like like I said, like you and Jordan Peterson and, and Jocko and, and Joe Rogan, who all believe this stuff and who have a voice to to really like put it out there, to kind of put a stake in the ground and, and like kind of you hear the pussification of America, like the, the toughening of America, you know, like they like really instill that. Yeah. You touched on the thing where 
And I love this. Have you ever seen A Million Ways to Die in the West? I haven't. It's so fucking good. I know you like comedies. It's uh, it's by the same guy from Family Guy, Seth MacFarlane. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's in the Old West, and it's a you know, it's making fun of the Old West. But there's kids running through the streets in the Old West by the saloons down these dirt roads, and they've got these giant wooden hula hoops with a stick, and the stick's in the middle of it, and they're just running with this ring in the stick, and uh, the fucking old people are like these damn kids are going to go blind playing that ring and the stick game all day long. You know, like they're going to be, they're going to be retards when they grow up playing the ring and the stick game, you know? And it's like, yeah. I think when we look at video games and things like that, certainly our generation, you know, we had Nintendo come out. Atari was pre pre generation or maybe right when you were born. But, uh, a lot of that sentiment was given to us. Like you're going to play video games. You're not going to do shit with your life. You're going to be a loser, blah, 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 fill in the blank. And that's certainly not true. You know, that was another thing that Duncan brought up on Rogan's was like, for sure, when you're immersed in these ridiculously complex video games, every fucking synapse in your brain is firing, right? Motor control you have, even if you're just using your thumbs, there's still some component of body movement that's tied to that. You might be sitting on your ass for eight hours, but there's still some type of response from what you see to what you do with your body. And uh, certainly with with VR coming out and things like that that are far more averse, immersive, I don't think that's the issue with our kids. I think the issue is we don't know how to interact with one another yeah. anymore. And that's a problem with social media. That's a problem when you say, I have all these friends, but I never see them. They're all online. Yeah. You know, I'm watching a video of what you did and trying to create the next cool thing so that I'll get more likes. Yeah. You know, and there's science that shows a dop- direct dopamine response, direct testosterone response, especially in men and women too. But but dopamine for sure across the board with how many likes you get, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh, that post didn't get so many. And then you feel fucking sad and depressed and I, mopey. I never even, first of all, I never knew what dopamine was. And then I read one of Simon Sinek's books, uh, might even start with why your leadership last, I don't remember, but I learned about the neurochemicals, right? So I just learned what that was. And I was like, oh, that's that little good feeling I get. Yeah, it's and your then, reward response. Yeah. Like, oh, and yeah. That, that whole world. So my wife, <laughs> there's two things my wife turned me on to with cell phones. When we were in college, her phone rang. This is like a sidebar. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Her phone rang and she was like, oh, I'm not going to take it. And then put it in her pocket. And I was like, you just didn't pick up a phone call that went to your cell phone? Like it never occurred to me. I have the option of not picking up this phone right now. Like, it just <laughs> never occurred to me. I was like, holy cow, phone screening. That's what this Mind is. blown. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, but then another thing that, that one day I put out something and she said, wow, that got a lot of likes. And I was like, what was that even like you? I never even looked at like I didn't. I just put stuff out there, you know. And for, I guess from a business perspective, it's not really good, you know, calculating how much people are enjoying what you're putting out there. Yeah. But then from that point on, I look at the likes, and I'm like, oh, it didn't get it. Oh, it did get it. And then with building something, I mean, that matters because of the interaction algorithms. Um, but it it so operating. So you we we're talking about you know, playing video games, which is fine. And you're, you're growing, your brain's working, et cetera. But then the other side of that is you also got to interact with people. So that's, that's where it's lost. And kids might say, well, I don't need to do that because I'll just play video games and be Mark Zuckerberg and I never even have to, but then it becomes, and I, you know, I don't want to speak out of my, you know, realm of comfortability here, but like, then you, you, you just become not interacting people and then not interacting people become robots. And then the human experience is no longer the human experience. So it is extremely important to, keep that human experience and connection and interaction alongside that other stuff. Gary Vee all the time talks about that idea that technology is not going to kill anything. Like they were saying it like with the wheel and the stick, you know, going blind mm-hmm. and oh, and Facebook and Snapchat and whatever else is out there. But you got to keep up the other end of it too, or it will go to shit. Yeah. You got to be in nature. You have to play with others and, and you have to interact face to face with people. I think that's the big thing. It's not that, I mean, certainly you can overdo anything. I played video games when I was a kid. My mom would be like, get out of the house. All right, that's it. I said, no more. You know, you, you had an hour. That's it. I'm turning mm-hmm. it off. And she'd come run over and just yank the cord out. And I'd be like, no, I didn't even get to save the game. I was you just know? about to conquer it, mom. Yeah. And then eventually she'd let me pause it, that kind of thing. But you'd have to like go outside and play. I can't. I can't count how many times that was screamed at me. And then, all right, I'm going outside and playing. And then you go outside and you play the entire rest of the day, especially in summertime with all your friends. And it could be anything. It could, And that's what's cool. When you're a kid, if you're forced to, 
through boredom, which is critical, yeah, yeah. you use your fucking imagination. You have to, right? So you create games to play. You create random things. And that doesn't happen. Like I, I noticed this with Bear because we'll let him watch iPad at times. If he's watching iPad, he's fixated on the thing. Right. But if we're in the bathtub and it's boring, he'll start creating yeah. little stories with the fucking dinosaurs. Like, mommy dinosaur is going to feed baby dinosaur. And yeah. T Rex is thirsty. Can you give him some water, please? Yeah. And we got a little water cup and I'll let him drink it. And T Rex, you know, he'll sit there and go, yeah. You know, but that's, that's fucking critical to actually be able to think for yourself and to have ideas. Yep. And, and that's the muse for all creation, right? What creativity do you have if everything, if your whole working world is brought to you on a silver platter versus how you design stuff and conjure up everything that we have in this world right now was first created in the mind. So if you're lacking that component of free thought and creativity, what good are you? I have two mental notes, right? So necessity is the mother of invention, which is kind of what you just said there. But then also when you're talking about bear in the bathtub, all I can think is shampoo is better. It goes on first and cleans the hair. And <laughs> no, conditioner is better. It goes on second and leaves the hair silky and smooth. <laughs> I can just picture bear like like Adam Sandler sitting there, I don't know, Billy Madison, like knocking him into the pool. <laughs> I've been thinking that for the last minute since you said that. <laughs> right when you started saying that, I saw that giant penguin walk walking around the house, <laughs> but not Billy's house, my house. Yeah. 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 I don't know. There's, there's, there's a lot of key comp components to what it takes, not only to raise uh, a good human being, but with what we're up against, because it, it's, you know, and this is something that, that we had talked about yesterday, you know, when I was mentioning my experience with Ben Greenfield and the fact that he had been homeschooled K through 12 it's really easy to see the components of that. And, you know, I have friends, my boy, Ryan Giles does like a home homeschooling uh, group, right? Shane. No, Shane. Shane does. Okay. And so like they, they can, the kids, you know, have, they go to different houses where the kids meet up with other kids. So there's a social aspect there. They're not always taught by the same parents. And I think that can kind of bridge the two worlds a little bit better, but, um, just this idea, like you can, there's so much more you can control when they're in your control. Obviously that's a shit ton more work, yeah. right? But um, when you take them to school, which gives you freedom, allows for both parents to have some time in the day to live their own life again and, and experience life and go to yoga, do whatever they wanna do, whatever's on their radar, um, you're basically handing them off to something that's broken, mm -hmm. right? And, and we're getting ready to do that right now. You know, we're, we're I think next week, we're putting Bear in preschool. Uh, he's got orientation. And, you know, the school looked awesome. It's a, it's a little private prep school. It looks, it looks really cool. The kids are great. The teachers are great. You know, they're, they're fundamentally trying to teach kids about the importance of learning and to love learning. And I think a lot of, a lot of the ph philosophical points are in tune with my wife and I. At the same time, they're going to run into all of the things that we're talking about. Yeah. Kids that are super young having their own cell phone, and then he's going to want a cell yeah. phone, right? Shit like that. Kids that would rather, you know, the, the lesson be taught on the TV screen, mm -hmm. you know, versus actually having to physically write with your hand. So I, I met some teacher that was telling me that a lot of young kids have trouble printing. Yeah. You know, or like or they took cursive know. out, right? But yep. they have trouble printing with a fucking pen mm -hmm. because everything is done on an iPad. That's absurd. So then, so, so, all right, that's one, like one faculty or one ability that's being lost, right? T picture sitting, uh, Alexa, order me, make, I just saw Mick Delivery watching the World Cup yesterday. Uh, <laughs> send me a Big Mac, two Big Mac meals and 20 piece chicken nugget. It's like- are, are we trying to, to self uh, implode, like implode? It, it, it blows my mind. Did you ever see the movie Wally -E with your kids? No. It's so good. -E. You got to watch it. Wally. -E. It's a Pixar. It's one of my absolute favorites. But in that, you know, it's in the future. We've destroyed the earth and uh, with trash. So they ship the humans off on this giant fucking super nice uh, cruise ship, right? It's out in space. And on it, it's got all the uh, amenities, you know? So everybody's on these like reclined chairs that float around like hoverboards. 
And whenever they want, it just beams up right next to them. So um, whatever they want beams yeah, up. Yeah, like I'm, yeah. I, I want a, a root beer float. Bing, it's right there in your hand. Or I want a cheeseburger. It's right there in your hand. And they're all fat blimps. Like they can't move. They haven't yeah. walked in years. They don't know what it's like. And then, of course, as the movie progresses, they actually have to walk and use their bodies again. But it, it's like the more we push ourselves towards convenience and and that's kind of i don't know you could be said that humans by nature are searching for convenience yeah. that's why we invent technology in the first place right hunting tools cutting tools whatever whatever our first technology was it's about convenience right so i don't think we're going to stop that anytime soon but at the same time that could be the downfall of many it's a right? gray it's area already is sure. right it's a gray area. Like how convenient do you want to get? It's the same thing with automation, like with emails and all this stuff. Like literally you, I mean, there's several people who have social media who don't you know everything's automated and every, you know, it, that that's whatever there it's a gray line, right? It's a dichotomy that like you gotta, as collectively as a people, I read a book. Um, uh, I think it might've been how Adam Smith can change your life. He's a Scottish philosopher and economist. And he said, no one's in Adam charge. Smith. Yeah. Adam Smith, uh, how Adam Smith can change your life. It's, uh, but the, one of the things I took from it was, uh, one is he said, there's no such thing as real world validation, right? And that's a thing kids need as well. Like you ain't the champ, you're not the champ. Like that's it, that's real world validation. Uh, but another thing that ties into what you're saying is, is he said, uh, uh, no one's in charge yet. Somehow we're all in charge. No one's in charge yet. Somehow we're all in charge. Mm -hmm. So like this stuff is happening, this, this balance that we're talking about, like the convenience, the, uh, our, our search for, you know, your brain wants habits, your brain wants to go the same route. It wants to not think it's, it's, it's wired that way. But then collectively as a people with no one being in charge, but everyone being in charge, th there's, there's gotta be a line where collectively as a per pe as a people, a, a human race that we say, or we at least balance that, you know, that scale. Yeah. What are some of the ways that you've sought out, you know, you talk about Jocko Willink, what are some of the ways that you've sought out discipline because discipline equals freedom yeah. is a really cool quote to throw out yeah. and it makes sense when you kind of get that but you know being that we don't fight anymore and we don't have deadlines in the same way yeah. at least if we have a deadline it's not the same impact as somebody's going to try to knock my head off yeah. right how is how is how have you taken discipline from your youth and wrestling into discipline as a teacher and discipline in fighting and apply that to your life now? Yeah, that's a, it's, that's not an easy question. And it's a difficult question. And I've thought, you know, Jocko is very matter of fact, you just do it. That's how you do it. You just do it, period. You don't hit snooze, et cetera. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't do that. And I'm really, really disciplined, right? So even I need like some things to, to get me through that. And I think the primary one so I think I, I, I lucked out maybe by coming, coming across the sport of wrestling and, and being absorbed by it from a, a familial perspective, grew up, you know, wrestlers, we we're all wrestlers. And, you know, so I think I lucked into it. So even on the other side of wrestling and fighting, I still, that is my core being, right? So I'm, I'm a disciplined person. So for 95% of my life, I don't need any practices. I don't need any, because I already have it. You know, I've been doing it. But for the average person, that's not, well, okay, Spaniard, I, I'm not that. So what are you going to leave me with, right? So one of the things I've, so my show, so I, I have a show and it's a, it's basically a media hub. What's the name of your show? So Just we're, for listeners, we'll yeah, link to it in the show notes. For sure. We're, we're transitioning. And honestly, sometimes I call it the Spaniard show. Sometimes I call it world's toughest lifelong learner. But if you search Spaniard on any podcast, app, that's what I made sure. Like, okay. just search Spaniard. You'll find my show and in, in my, my face. Um, but with that show, you know, I do interviews. I, I have a, what I learned this week. So I literally, I read, I take notes. I showed you the notebook yesterday. And then, and then I pick seven of the neatest learning points out and I create a 20 minute solo episode of this is the cool shit I learned. Right. It's like, as if you go to a comedy show and they're telling you jokes, you're going to a show and I'm telling you what I learned. You know, it, it could be from a book, a podcast interview, whatever it is. Um, but the, the part that leads into discipline. So I have a daily series that I put out that's eight minutes long based on what I read that, that day or the day before. Okay. And there's all kinds of books that I read business books. I've read Steve Martin's book. I read Jordan's book, whomever Aubrey's book. Um, 523, I think was this 24 was this morning. So 524 consecutive Monday through Fridays, I posted that, right? 
So a lot of people, and your eyes got big when I said that, a lot of people were like, holy shit, that's really impressive. But to me, it's like, really, it's just reading is a part of me. So I read, you know, six, seven days a week anyway. And it takes, I don't know, eight minutes to record, five minutes to upload. You know, it's like two hours of my day that I got to block out and chunk every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back to the discipline and how you implement it. If that were just for me and I, and I wasn't live streaming it or I wasn't logging it or I wasn't posting it, maybe I'd be like, all right, well, I can skip today and do two tomorrow. But because I know, <laughs> so Scott Adams, who's the creator of Dilbert, he wrote an awesome book called How to, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big. Um, he said that when he was writing his books, he would imagine that there were a million people waiting for that book to be published, right? And that would drive him to meet the deadlines, get it done. So when, I, when I'm like publishing my episodes, I imagine, you know, that there's like, a million people like, oh, I can't wait for Spaniards episode. Re in reality, there might be 50 <laughs> or a hundred, <laughs> but I, I carry that mindset of no, people are depending on me, whether they are or aren't. And that really kicks me in the butt. So it's mm. like, if you have trouble with discipline, I mean, account, I guess this is kind of accountability is, is the thing there, but bring other people into the picture. And if you're still having trouble with that, bring really important people into the picture that you will let down if you don't do it. And that further than that, it's like, I, I, or you, you know, this whole, first of all, I want to say this, and this is not blowing smoke up yours or Aubrey's ass anyway, total human optimization. Blow that smoke. Okay. I'm blowing it. Puff it. <laughs> um, that's not on Kyle's ass, by the way, it's in the microphone. <laughs> um, total human optimization is up there with just do it as like the best taglines to me ever, because with total human optimization, you, Kyle Kingsbury, Aubrey on it, you can put out everything, but if I don't utilize it, it's not worth anything to me, right? Like mm -hmm. you can't make me do it, right? So eventually if I'm saying, um, you know, bring other people into it, if that doesn't work, bring someone who's really important into it, that if you let down, it, it'll make you feel like, you know, like you're bad. If that doesn't work, then you gotta look yourself in the mirror and say, I don't really want that thing. Like, I don't really want that change. I don't really want that. Uh, responsibility. I don't really want to achieve that goal because at the end of the day, like you have to do it. You know, if I think like there's a million people waiting for me and I'm still going to sleep, then you know, I'm a piece of shit and I don't want to, I don't want to do, I don't want to put it out there. Or it doesn't matter to you. Yeah. Right it doesn't enough, matter. Right? That, it has to, you have to find the thing that drives you enough that matters, you know, whatever that is, it's different for everybody, but whatever you're passionate about, that's the fucking thing you go for. It, and people will say like, like with, um, especially people in my, and when I say people, I'm not talking about like, I'm talking like my family or my close friends or my, my, my loyal listeners, right? Um, they're like, how do you do it? How do you do it? And my response a lot of times is just, I really want what I really want. Like I really freaking want the things that I want. So all the stuff that I don't really want just goes by the, way, by the wayside. So if people would take a look in the mirror, I was using analogy when you're brushing your teeth, and just kind of like come a lot of, I love talking to you about like truth and, and being authentic, et cetera. Like if you just look in the mirror and say like, I really don't want to stop eating processed foods. I really don't want to lose weight. I really don't want to X, Y, and Z. Then there'd be so much less stress and resistance within yourself. If you were just honest, like I Spaniard 37, don't want to eat perfectly. I want to eat really well, like 80% of the time. And that's it. And I'm good with that. So I think that, you know, if people just take the time to do that, you would really be able to lose the stress of, should I eat this thing or not eat this thing? Because you'd know, oh, I really do want to eat that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good to a degree, as long as it's periodic. You know, the slippery slope for most people, is, as Rob Wolf talks about in Where to Eat, is that food has been made for us. It's genetically, it's I mean, tricky, not, yeah. it's, 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 it's tricking our genetics. It's tricking our taste buds. It's it's composed by some of the best scientists in the world to have flavor combinations not found in nature that are irresistible, right? He uses that just one pop, you can't stop, right? Pringles commercial. Yep. And it's fucking true, right? So, I mean, obviously every, everything in moderation, including moderation, but it's a slippery slope for a lot of people who do have food addiction because sugar is more addictive than fucking cocaine is. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. Yep. But I wanted to touch on something. I brought this up, wasn't on my phone. I'm on my phone, but I wasn't on my phone. Uh, you talked about, with regard to discipline, how important it is that you think of others, right? And there's that's a big one. Uh, when you come to a place in your life where, and this is important for kids to learn too, 
is that it's bigger than you, mm -hmm. right? Whatever that is, it's bigger than you. And if you can think about others and some act of service, that raises the bar on how important it is to do well for yourself as well as for others, right? So it reminded me of this quote Tate Fletcher posted that is just fucking, it's awesome. It says, listen, I know it's tough. The weight can feel too heavy to move. It's hard to muster the drive for yourself. You're the shit. Know that. Show that. Walk with some pride and swag, regardless of how you feel. Do your deadlifts. Practice your chokes and sweeps. Do your makeup. Write that blog. Make your bed. Force a smile. Quiet your mind. Whatever electrifies your greatness. To reach the highest standard of yourself you can muster. Because you got to know, there's a little dude or dudette out there looking, learning, watching how it's done. And God damn it, they need to strive. They need you to strive. Walk like you've taken that responsibility. Don't drop the torch. You're the only light they've got. Yep. That's it. That's it. And especially being a father, it's like, man, my kids got to, I want them to believe it. Uh, so a lot of what I do also is documenting for my kids. I'm going to be dead. I could be dead tomorrow. And, and my kids, like I want them to know what their dad thought, right? So like we're raising our kids right now. And they're going to absorb, you know, like I absorb respect. I absorb uh, my dad when I was a kid saying, don't go around telling people how good you are. Let them tell you. I absorb that stuff. But like, I thought, how awesome would it be if literally they had like a, a daily message from their dad? That's it. So like that all, that, that, that at its core drives everything I do because it's like Gracie and Rocky every day, if I'm on 525 right now, by the time I die, hopefully I'm on 10,000 or I don't even know how many days, if that's only like five years, <laughs> a long time from now, they're gonna have like a daily log. And to me, that, that, that fuels, and we were talking yesterday, like it's not easy building something from football career to fighting career to being here and on it for you. Like you couldn't have planned, you couldn't have, you didn't know this, you couldn't have planned it. And it's hard. And, and, and I remember when, when we met in 2012, uh, going on that tour for the troops, you would talk about living in a garage, in your parents' garage. And like, that's not easy. And the, the average person isn't going to do that. Like they just, they, they want it to be, I don't know, easier than that or, or prettier than that. And it's simply not prettier than that. So kids or adults, it's like, and I, part of what I do also is therapy for myself. I need to hear this shit. When I say you on my show, I'm looking at me in the mirror. I'm saying you, Spaniard, you, you, because that's it. And then I'm talking to my kids and then I'm talking to anyone who will listen. Um, but yeah, there's little dudes and dudettes and my son and daughter are one of those dudes and dudettes. And if you're out there whether you have kids, that, I mean, that should be a no brainer. If you don't have kids and think you're your, 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 your nephew, your cousin, the kid you teach, kid in your town, you know, they pick up on this stuff. Yeah. Even somebody who's three years younger than you at the office or on the team. Or even your you best know? friend, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's all people we got to look out for. Well, shit, brother. We crushed it. We got our hour in. Yeah. I uh, I want to put this out there. I want to blow some more smoke up your ass. <laughs> it's, blow uh, away. I'll fan it towards <laughs> me. to tickle, right? <laughs> I, I love being here. I love being around you, Kyle Kingsbury. I love being around Anna. I love being around Aubrey. I love soaking this in because you've opened my mind to stuff that I told you last night, 10 years ago, I would have said, that's crazy. That's weird. That's insane. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And now I'm like, whoa, I've, I've loved this process of absorbing it, synthesizing, figuring out, and just becoming more aware of it. So, you know, I sincerely appreciate being here and what we were, doing. we were, you know, for reference and what he was saying 10 years ago, that'd be crazy. We were talking about the anal fisting tent at Burning Man <laughs> and me wanting to attend it this year. And he was like, yeah, 10 years ago, I'd say that's weird. But right now I'm like pretty cool with it. <laughs> no, yeah, actually, I think I said, wait a minute. No, it's still crazy. I said during that con same conversation, I said, I feel like I'm on drugs right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Like, that's a good conversation <laughs> when you feel like you're on drugs, man. That's a great like, conversation. Holy shit. That's reality. Oh my goodness. Yeah, brother. Well, fuck, where can people find you on uh, on your podcast, Search Spaniard? Yeah, so Search Spaniard on iTunes or whatever podcast app you have. Uh, my website and social media is charliespaniard.com. It's got speaking programs. Uh, it's got my, uh, my my collection of learning, basically, is what is what I'm turning it into. So charliespaniard.com. Book lists, things like that? Yeah, reading lists. So I, I probably, on that reading list, I probably have 70 or 80 
Um, wow. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I, it, I, I don't, you hear people say, I read a book a day. I don't read a book a day. I read a book every five days or 10 days, but I freaking extract every thing that I, you know, I, for myself and for my kids and for the audience that I think can help kick them in the butt. It's like cliff notes, it, Spaniard it, notes. It's the, yeah, that's, it's like, it's not a summary. It's not, it, it's, it's just, you know, when you're like waking up or you're at that breaking point in a fight, an actual fight or not a fight. And, and then you just keep going. That's, that's what I'm trying to provide. But Charlie Spaniard on social media and charliespaniard.com. Fuck yeah, brother. It's been excellent having you. Thanks, brother.